Hi everyone, my name is Christina Perla. And my name is Janet Carr. Welcome to another episode of the Women in 3D Printing podcast. In spirit of the upcoming Type 3D Printing virtual conference taking place January 27 to 28th next year, 2021, we are going to be dedicating the first series to the type. So you might be wondering, what is the type? Type represents the tracks for the conference, technology, industry, people, and economics. And as your hosts, we are so excited to share our conversations with these trailblazing women. The all-female speaker lineup we have prepared for this conference is made up of women that have carved their careers in additive manufacturing and have inspired all of us. We can't wait to introduce them to you so you can get to know them before the conference. So we invite you to hit that subscribe button, follow us on LinkedIn, and get to know the stories of these awe-inspiring women before the event. We'd also like to give a shout out to our platinum sponsors, HP, Trump, Matter Hackers, GE Additive, and Dassault for making all of this even possible. I'm really excited to introduce you to the next upcoming Type Series podcast speaker for the upcoming conference in 2021 that we're hosting at Women in 3D Printing. Her name is Angedeka Harry. She is the founder and board member of YTF, the Youth for Technology Foundation. She's also founded the 3D Printing Academy for Girls. With her extra time, she spends it at the World Economic Forum, specifically the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, to promote entrepreneurial, innovative, sustainable, and social impact initiatives. And at the Ashoka, as the Ashoka Fellow, really developing social impact uh, solutions to help our community across the world. So before we get started, can you share a little bit about what launched your career? Really excited to learn where all of this passion began. My background is non-traditional in the sense, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer. So um, when people think 3D printing and emerging technologies, sometimes, you know, oftentimes they think an engineering background. So I am an entrepreneur. I am a social entrepreneur. Um, you know, a two-time founder, uh, 3D Printing Academy for Girls is a spin-off, an ed tech spin-off off of Youth for Technology Foundation. You know, I've been in the technology space um, for many years, really at the intersection of diversity and, and, and technology. And so, you know, when I founded Youth for Technology Foundation in the early 2000s, I was getting the questions like, why, who cares about young people in that concept and yeah. um, who, who cares about technology, especially in its application mm -hmm. to the de developing world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there were issues that seemed more, um, you know, larger issues such as, you know, the obsolete nature of education or healthcare or sanitation. And those were issues high on the totem pole in developing nations. And so, you know, coming, coming to speak to people about technology was not a priority. Well, fast forward a decade and a half, two decades, everything revolves obviously around technology, even more so the emerging aspects of, of that technology. And so our work has become um, more relevant, but also harder um, because there are more players in the market. And so there's competition, there's a lot of noise. Um, it's hard to, you know, <laughs> decipher what is and what isn't. Um, but, you know, we still remain very laser focused and very, very sharp on, on our fundamental mission, which has always been to create those enriched learning communities where appropriate technology affords opportunities for youth and women. What, what got you inspired or started in this? Because, you know, just launching a new nonprofit organization to focus on this, you mm -hmm. know, massive right. challenge. I think it was really, you know, growing up in a developing country myself. So I was born to a Nigerian father and American mother. I, I was born in Nigeria and um, really grew up in an upper middle class home. My parents were in education, but uh, my mom was an education entrepreneur. And um, when I moved to the United States in pursuit of a college education, I think my greatest, really, my greatest surprise was not necessarily cultural or economic or, or societal necessarily, it was the influence of technology in education. Um, I mean, what I saw just walking into the college classrooms, um, you know, being kind of immersed in that digital environment was really the aha moment. And then shortly after, you know, graduating from college, I began a corporate career, first at General Electric and then at Microsoft. And it was really there that I saw the influence of technology, not just in business, but in society. And 
um, really felt a compelling, almost like an obsession. Uh, I had to do something. And it was, you know, um, during my career at Microsoft, I thought, you know, a young girl growing up with big dreams in a developing country, um, moving to the U.S., finding herself fast forward, working for, you know, the world's number one software company. I, I just had to do something, even if it meant changing the life of one young person growing up in a developing country. Because in my mind, if you know, if I saw the gap, if the gap was so evident in someone like myself growing up in an urban community, a child of educated parents, upper middle class, how much more, you know, a young person growing up in a peri-urban or even a rural community in one of these developing countries, there's just absolutely nowhere, no way that they can com compete, right? And when you talk about you know, 21st century opportunities and you talk about, you know, everyone has a chance. Indeed, everyone doesn't have a chance if they don't have the right platform or the right opportunity because where talent is relative, opportunity clearly isn't. And so technology is that bridge, that enabler, that provides um, the equity that the world needs. Um, but at the same time, it should be affordable and accessible to, in essence, everyone on the planet. And so, you know, my, my, urge to start Youth for Technology Foundation was really based on, on my personal experience. First as an obsession, first as a you know, volunteer-led group at, at Microsoft with you know, a couple of my colleagues um, from different countries all over the world, really kind of having this passion. And then I found myself really immersed in it where um, you know, I really had to, I, I had to spend all my energies building the organization. And so it was hard, um, hard to leave Microsoft, but something that I had to do to really focus on building the organization. So spent um, quite a bit of my career in, in the social impact space. Um, I became an Ashoka Fellow in 2011. That really put a, um, I guess, a, a feather of credibility to the work that we do. Um, soon after, we were recognized by the World Economic Forum when I became a social entrepreneur there. And you know, the work has just, um, just continued. Um, it's not easy. It's extremely hard, but but it's meaningful. And um, you know, when we looked at our foray into the U.S. market, we saw a lot of the a lot of similarities uh, in low-income communities in the U.S. Um, you know, Louisville is has the sixth worst education in the United States. Um, there are all sorts of gender and economic disparities here. We work in West Louisville primarily, and uh, 3D Printing Academy for Girls is really an ed tech startup that um, looks at equipping primarily middle school age girls with, um, with skills, STEM skills, um, to enable their pursuit of STEM education and careers. And we believe that an igniting way to do that is through, um, through emerging technologies like 3D printing. Yeah, why did you choose 3D printing as a medium for education? Or did you experiment with multiple types of technologies? Right. We started with 3D printing. That is still the focus. Yeah. Um, but you know, we we explore the, the students learn a variety of you know three, a variety of emerging technologies, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. Um, even with our 3D Africa work, and that's that's in Africa. But um, we started with 3D printing really because 3D printing. Um, enables people to see or envision what what they can be and what their world can be, right? And so this notion of creating anything anywhere is very powerful. It's empowering, it's real, um, it's economically advantageous, especially for people living in, um, living in low-income communities. And so 3D printing very quickly brings things to life. Um, also from a creativity perspective, especially for um, you know, the younger students, so take for instance, middle school age girls, um, there is this notion that girls cannot do technology and this notion that um, it's too hard. But when they are able to, girls like to make things because they like to make their community better. When they're able to actually see how they can create things for the betterment of their community, they may be learning chemistry, physics, math along the way, but you're not necessarily telling them, okay, you know, learn math. You're telling them to create something. And through that creativity, they are actually gaining those essential foundational skills 
that help them pursue STEM careers. So we started with 3D printing um, first in Africa. So in 2015, um, we launched 3D Africa in, in Nigeria. I will tell you that was even more eye-opening than launching Youth for Technology. If people are trying to also do the same, what kind of tips do you want to share with them or some of the uh, stories that they can learn from your experiences? Right. I mean, the, the space is, is hard. Um, so there are, you know, every day there are changes to the technology, there are upgrades, there are different applications of the technology. And so, um, and there are also many players, right? We're almost um, in this era that I would call, I, I guess, a, a you know, te technology solution burst, right? Everyone, especially during COVID, right? There's a solution for everything, COVID related and ed tech, and everyone's coming up with everything at the same time. So there's a lot of noise in the market. And so it's challenging sometimes to be able to um, differentiate yourself but I think with longevity in the market and, and track record of doing this work, we, you know, we just didn't wake up to it. Mm -hmm. This has been, you know, what we have done um, for a very long time. So, you know, some of the uh, areas that I would share with, with individuals uh, in the ed tech space, especially hardware, it's expensive, right? The initial investment is expensive. 3D printers are not priced where exactly where we would want to see them, um, even for industry application right now. So it is expensive. Um, to, to enter the market. Um, but, you know, I, I think we've seen the cost of, of that technology, you know, come low, but in many, many cases, there has to be a social business model behind it. So we can't, um, we can't run programs free of charge because there's an investment that we have to make. And so that needs to be considered as well. If the equipments and materials are expensive, what kind of um, solutions do you normally use? Do you normally also develop partnerships with machine manufacturers? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, like MakerBot is one of our partners. Um, we partner with HP, not, not um, at an equipment level just yet, but um, we co-created HP. Um, we co-created uh, 3D printing curriculum on HP Life with them in 2018. That curriculum has been accessed by um, it has been transformed to six different uh, languages and accessed by over 40,000 people all over the world um, in, in different categories. Autodesk is also a big partner of ours. Um, 3D systems used to be, we actually used to use their 3D printers before they got out of the consumer market. So they donated um, a bunch of those to our work in, in Louisville. And so, yes, absolutely. We need the private sector. We can't do this work alone. Um, and so we partner closely with the private sector to implement. You move from Nigeria and Africa and then now you're in the States, what is the vision or the goal or what, what kind of impact are you hoping to make in the world? Is it every woman, girl, child having access to tech education? Yes, it's, it's all about economic empowerment, right? And we see technology as an enabler. Now that may come in the form of, you know, basic digital literacy all the way to mobile and, uh, and software application development to emerging technologies like 3D printing. We're not bringing emerging technologies to to people who do not have a taste of digital literacy just yet right you have to start somewhere and so but fundamentally absolutely we, we believe that technology is an enabler and that it can be used in a variety of of ways you know in the 3d printing space i mean just basic computer-aided design human-centered design learning for our women entrepreneurs that we work with um is, is very, very useful for them in, in the way, you know, as they start to think about the abilities to, to make anything anywhere and the abilities to access global markets as well. And so the overarching vision is to really inspire a culture shift that um, people can, can make anything and start from there. And do you work closely with government organizations to help bring more programs or more funding? I think on LinkedIn recently that there are more and more people jumping into the nonprofit space because they have extra time they want to give. What are some of the tips that you might give someone if they want to also make a socioeconomic impact? Do it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, a volunteer is one thing, but if this is a, a career shift, you know, it, it has to be your passion, right? Time is one thing. Yes, time is, time is indeed the only thing we don't have any control over, but uh, it also has to be passion because if it's not passion, it would, it, it won't be sustainable, right? And so you see a lot of fly-by-night initiatives. Okay, we want to create 
you know, X, Y, Z, but then, you know, two years down the line, there's nothing, nothing, you know, happening because it wasn't fundamental passion, right? It was copy paste. So, you know, the advice that I give um, young entrepreneurs and people looking to do something is, is it really your passion? Does it keep you up at night? Does it make you angry, right? Does it make you so angry that you want to change it, right? And so um, the digital canyon made me angry because I just knew that there was no way a young person growing up in a developing country could compete for 21st century opportunities if they didn't have access to technology, which afforded them access to a brighter future education-wise and or entrepreneurship opportunities. There was just no way. I mean, I, I lived it. There was just no way. You can't expect it, right? And so it, it kept me up at night and I was, I was really obsessed with that notion. And so, you know, that would be where I would start with, are you passionate about this? And if so, why? And um, just understand that the, the road is, is windy and it's extremely hard. There's a lot of sacrifice on the outside. It looks like a straight line, but um, there's no success without a tremendous amount of turmoil. And so that is the um, advice that I would, I would give any, any young uh, you know, social entrepreneur and or entrepreneur. Speaking of turmoil, what are, do you have a turmoil like story that turned into something that became a foundation for success? You know, I think the fundamental quality of any relationship, whether it's with government, private sector, even civil society, so not for profits, is, is this currency of trust that we all take for granted. So trust is the currency of any relationship. Over the years, we've grown to actually be very selective in the partners that we, we choose. And um, because not all partners are right partners for us, right? And so, you know, some partnerships, this is a part of their CSR budget, but really we, we prefer to be part of their innovation budget because that's more long-term and more sustainable in regards to our partnership, right? We're not talking about $20,000 for a small CSR project. We're talking about how can we build alongside with you? And so in terms of turmoil, you know, anything from, you know, partnerships that maybe have not turned out the way we wanted, um, you know, partnerships in which, you know, maybe we've partnered with the private sector and um, I'm not going to mention any names, but the goal has been to train, you know, 5 million girls to code. Um, but at the end of the day, we have these big numbers, but there's no follow-up. So there's no monitoring and evaluation. So what, because the budget wasn't available for that, the budget was made available for top line training. Well, if you train, but you don't really know what happens with the training and how that influences your theory of change, that's just rubbish, right? It's just those numbers on the dashboard to make your company look good. And so we've had a few of those. We've learned along the way. Um, and so we've come to the realization that we will not work with any private sector company if there's not a line for monitoring and evaluation in our budgets, right? Because it's not about the training, the top level training, it's about what these clients, our beneficiaries, do with the training. Do they create jobs? Do they pursue science, technology, engineering, and math education at the tertiary level? What do they do with it? How are we following up? How are we measuring true impact? Okay, so that is one, one aspect of, you know, it's, it's turmoil in the sense that it happened, we didn't like it, and now we've become bolder in changing our model so that that is incorporated into budgets. And then secondly, um, you know, we are, we are independent. We don't peg ourselves on government or private sector. Um, so, you know, in some of the countries we work with, government wants to donate space. But we also realize that government changes, you know, every four years, every five years or what have you. And one administration's interest may not be the other administration's interest. So we've been burned there, especially in our earlier years um, where stuff was donated, but with the change of the administration, donated by the government, but with the change of the administration, we're starting from scratch with, with nothing, right? And we have to reconvince and we have to resell our services to this new administration. And it's just, it takes its toll and it's, it's really not worth it in our mm -hmm. perspective. I am an entrepreneur and um, people say, well, social entrepreneur, entrepreneur. I am an entrepreneur, but um, all of my work and most of my purpose has been designed around social impact. So what is this idea? How does it apply to the good of the community? And so, um, you know, those are interesting conversations that I have with entrepreneurs. 
So if someone, let's say, is not an engineer and is budding to take an idea and bring it to the market, mm -hmm. given your experience, what, what would you suggest them to do? Hard things are hard, right? Entrepreneurship is hard. If it wasn't, everyone would be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is not right for everyone also. We shouldn't belittle employment, you know, working for someone. In Africa, sometimes people see employment as less interesting and or important, but that is not correct. Even our young people, we encourage them to be employed by an organization or a company first before venturing out into entrepreneurship. Um, some books out there that uh, some entrepreneurs may be worth following. Well, of course, I, I don't know if you listen to Guy Raz's um, podcast around entrepreneurship, How I Built This. He just wrote his first book that's coming out next month. Um, I pre-ordered that book, actually, because I'm looking forward to reading the stories of many entrepreneurs that he highlights in that book and some of their challenges and the turmoils and successes they faced along their entrepreneurial growth. And then, you know, balancing all of that with really purpose and vision, right? What is your, what is your life's purpose? And, you know, um, a book recently, um, this is his third book, but Professor Harry Kramer of Northwestern Kellogg School of Management um, just uh, wrote uh, Your 168, which is really about how we utilize our 160 hours of the week, 24 times seven, right? We have a choice um, in which we, you know, we're very selective. Do we go and play golf? Do we take care of our kids? Do we write in our journal? Do we learn new technologies and new skills? How are we spending that 160 hours? And how does that bubble up into our goal for our life and our purpose for our life because everyone has a purpose the question is um, are we living that purpose right and that, that really takes self-reflection and um, and discipline figuring out what your purpose in life is such a big question right mm -hmm. how does how does one start thinking about that if you're going through the waves the hamster wheel climbing the corporate ladder how did you find your purpose? Because you basically went from corporate America, now social entrepreneur, enabling the youth. Your history and your background really helped fire you up. But what was that inflection point where you're like, can't take it anymore. I got to do something about it. I remember my dad talking a lot about the importance of education, right? They can take everything from you, but they can't take away your education. And so he had, you know, he was very adamant in ensuring that his children got as much education as possible. To much whom is given, much is required. Though I didn't see, you know, working for a job as, you know, at Microsoft as the best thing ever, I just thought, wow, I've come a long way. You know, Muhammad Ali here in Louisville is famous for his quote around, service is the rent we pay to others on this planet. Really this notion of, you know, paying it forward and giving back has always been a fundamental part of my, my DNA. Thinking about my purpose, I had a little bit of the knowledge um, working in, in tech. I had the lived experience, lived in the sense that I knew the difference between developing and developed. I didn't have the resources because my stock options were underwater and I was going from something to nothing. Um, so don't get there. I did not leave Microsoft a millionaire like many others. I left Microsoft very uncertain about my future. No salary, no health insurance, just this idea that I was passionate. It wasn't about the resources um, that led to my purpose. It was just really about wanting to, to give back and wanting to change the world. So on a final note, um, what are future developments that you're excited about that you're looking forward to over the next, let's say, three, five, or a decade of years? Some of the things that I'm looking forward to over the next uh, three years are really, you know, more young people, especially girls and women, um, being excited about technology. I mean, we see tremendous growth in the 3D printing market, for instance, you know, somewhere going from what 13 billion or so this year to almost 64 billion in about four or five years. So there is growth in the market. And at the same time, the number of STEM jobs are increasing. I think some of the data that I've seen recently in, in the US specifically is, is that STEM jobs have grown about 9 million between you know, between 2012 and what is forecasted for 2022. We also know that 47% of women in the U.S. are in the labor market, but less than 15% of those women are in engineering and STEM careers, with 
very, very few being, being Latin American and, and African American. And so there is a lot of work to be done there in terms of um, gender and, and diversity and ensuring that everyone, especially girls and women have, especially girls and women of a minority and underrepresented background have an opportunity to see technology as, as something that they can do, something that they are very, very comfortable with. The, the next three to five years, I, I hope to see more girls and more women um, pursuing technology education, pursuing technology careers, and really being confident in their ability to pursue this education and these careers, and even you know establishing organizations, for-profit, non-profit, or what have you, that are fundamentally built around technology. I can't wait to see what you end up doing with your future and all the programs that you're going to be developing with all your community, because I think you've done such a great job, and it's definitely inspiration to remind us and think about in those 160 hours a week, what are you doing with your life? And can you make the world a little bit better? I really look forward to learning more about how you think of the world and how you're maneuvering around it at the type conference under the economic trip. Absolutely. I mean, that's just um, a, a wonderful, wonderful close, Janet. You know, those 168 hours are very, very important. And, you know, working at the intersection of economics, gender and technology, you know, you can't be what you cannot see, right? And so as a mother myself of three young daughters, ages 16, 12, and 12, I think it's very important that my daughters see positive women role models in technology, right? That they can aspire to be, that they see those superheroes. And it's interesting that um, this conversation comes, you know, at, at a weekend that's, you know, a, a sad weekend um, in many regards in terms of, you know, the passing of uh, Chadwick Boseman of, of, uh, of Black Panther. Um, he was a, just an extremely talented actor and really a role model in the way African-American children primarily saw themselves to be powerful. And, you know, Black Panther was actually one of the, an entire year in 2018, 3D Printing Academy for Girls, we focused our curriculum specifically on Black Panther. I mean, it was phenomenal to see these eyes of these young middle school age girls just light up when they knew that they could, you know, actually 3D print Ramona's um, Ramona's crown and her um, and, and her outfit and and that they could 3D print actual um, things that were a part of Black Panther and so you know it's just incredible that um, the, you know um, Chadwick Boseman was able to and and the rest of the cast in Black Panther were able to influence a generation of young people particularly African Americans um, really with the understanding that they can create and make anything and that technology can really transform communities. And so I look forward to being able to, um, you know, continue to help in my little way, continue to help spread that message and, and um, in, impact the world for the good of all. Thank you so much for coming on to our Type podcast series. I'm really excited to having you in the future. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us at the Women in 3D Printing podcast type series. If you like our content, please hit that subscribe button follow us on LinkedIn or other social media platforms. We'd also like to give a shout out to our platinum sponsors, HP, Trump, GE Additive, Matter Hackers, and Dassault for making all of this even possible. So mark your calendars for January 27th to 28th next year in 2021. And visit us at type3dprinting.com to save your seat. And feel free to drop us a line if you have any questions or feedback.